because we're going to make a special effort for sinners tomorrow night to come receive the Lord Jesus. And each night, of course, the Holy Spirit is here. Wherever you go, He's always there. You just, you'll just you never get away from Him. David said no matter where he made his bed, God was there. Because the angels of God are encamped about those who fear them. Just think, they just take their camp and sit right down by you. And watching you all the time. In our country down in the south, we have a lot of colored people that it's very spiritual. And they come to my meeting sometime and they used to sing a little song for me. I remember used to be an old colored sister. She couldn't sing that and just bring the Spirit of God into the midst of people. All day, all night, the angels are watching over me. Oh, she couldn't sing that. And uh, so I always just almost had to tie my hands to keep from ruining the meeting. Just jumping up and down and screaming around all over the place. Now, you didn't think I did that, did you? But I do. I don't, but he does it anyway. I believe if anybody felt the way I did, they'd do the same thing. It's just an experience. Yes, sir, it sure is. Now, so now, remember these announcements. And now, let us bow our heads just before we turn to his precious word. Dear Lord... We are grateful to Thee for the privilege of knowing Thee as our personal Savior, knowing that we have passed from death unto life, then that the Spirit of Christ dwells in us and around us and among us, and we are His people that's called by His name. And the angels are watching over us day and night. They never leave. They're encamped about. And we can expect God to do most anything at any time because of the presence of the angels of God who are commissioned by Him to watch us and to care for us. And now, Father, we pray that the angels of God will take their place tonight by the side of each believer and all around through the building. And may something be said or done that would cause this meeting to be a... a, a spot in our memories, in our hearts, that we would remember all the days of our life for the outpouring of the glory of God tonight. Bless my ministering brethren who are sitting here, listening, supporting by prayer, by every effort that they can. God bless these brethren. We pray that you'll just give them unction and power and the desire of their hearts. May it be fulfilled in their life. Others who are out in the audience, may it be the same way with them, Father. Forgive us of our shortcomings, for we have many of those. And we pray that you will take your word now and bless it to our heart. And I would ask thee, Lord, may it not be thought by the people because that I am referring to an experience that you have given to me and telling the truth, Lord. May it not be thought that it was meant personally, but that what you are fixing to do for your people may all rejoice and all believe and all benefit by it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that. Amen. Now, <clears throat> some years ago, how many is present in the building tonight who remembers when I first come up the West Coast praying for the sick many years ago. I was, did you know San Jose was the first invitation I ever had west of the Mississippi? San Jose, California. I don't know who it was, but I got a letter from someone that invited me to San Jose immediately after Robert Doherty's little Betty was healed that time with that uh, San Fidus dance. And that was the beginning of the ministry that I started on the fields. And I remember, and many of you people can think, that in that day, praying for the sick, I'd catch them by the hand and just stand there. And then the Lord would just speak. I wouldn't use my own thinking, just what was wrong with the person. Exactly what he told me would happen the night that I met him at Green's Mill at the camp, when he told me what would happen. And then he told me that it come to pass that you know the very secret of their hearts. 
And you remember me saying it, it would happen that way. How many remembers the old timers remembers me saying that it would happen? Well, you see, it has happened that way. Now he promised that it would move again. Now, in the last time here, last spring, I was speaking to you all of something that was fixing to take place. I believe I, best I remember by the tape that I said I could almost reach out and feel it. It was so close. How many is at the meeting last year and heard that scene? Well, I want to tell you how that's progressed. That's what I want to do tonight. And before doing this, I believe that God can do anything that he wants to do. He's God. But I'm such a Bible believer that I believe that what he does should be recognized in the Bible. Don't you think the Bible ought to speak at first then? We know we're right. As long as the Bible, it's a promise that God made. Now, I want to get just for a moment the infallibility of the word See, to you. First, I want you to know that God is infinite. He's so perfect that he knew everything that ever would be. You believe that? He knew that before the world was ever created that we'd be sitting here tonight. If he's infinite. If he isn't infinite, then he isn't God. So if he's finite, he's like we are. But infinite, there's no way to explain it. And whatever God says is perfect, he cannot improve it or take it back. It's perfect because God is perfect and his words are perfect. His promises can never fail. Now, you must have that kind of faith in God when you read the Bible to believe his promises. You must remember he's perfect. His words are perfect. They can never fail. They can never be improved. They're perfect to start with. Now, we can build a better car today than we could 10 years ago. You could probably make a better airplane today. Scientists can because we're finite, improving in the tree of knowledge. But God is perfect to begin with. When he says anything, it's perfect. It can never be improved. Therefore, when God makes a promise, that promise is eternally right. It can never do nothing else but be right. And we want to think of that now as we read his word. Turn with me to Mark, the 11th chapter. And let's begin reading at the 20th verse of Mark, the 11th chapter. And as you're waiting for you to turn, I'll give you the back part of the lesson. Jesus had just went up to the temple. And on his road up, he went into the temple and began to drive out the people from changing money changers and doing things that wasn't right and told them it is written that God's house was a house of prayer but they had made it a den of thieves robbers misused God's house and then when he was going he found a fig tree the next morning that he had leaves the tree had leaves on it and he thought perhaps there would be some figs so he went to get some figs and there was no figs on it because it wasn't seasoned yet. And he said to the tree, No man eateth from thee from henceforth forever. And here's where we start now to read at the 20th verse. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed in the way, is with, uh, well, cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in 
his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. When I read this some time ago, it put a little damper on me because I've always taught and done tonight the same thing, that no blessings can come only by the atonement, that the atonement made the way for every redemptive blessing that Jesus died for. Therefore, this scripture puzzled me. Now, you've heard me say many times in the meetings, and I would quote it again tonight, that divine healing is something that God has already done. Salvation is something that's already paid for. Jesus paid, he was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes. We were healed. When he died at Calvary, he settled the sin question and the ever question there was in the line of redemption of man, even to the resurrection and all. And he proved that by his resurrection. Now, therefore, that if persons say, I was saved last night, I was saved 10 years ago. No, truly you were saved 1900 years ago. You just accepted it last night or 10 years ago. See, it's already paid for. It's something you accept what he's done for you. It's your faith in God that brings the blessing that you are claiming out of his word. Now, I believe that's just as sensible and sound as the gospel could be preached. Because it's what Jesus did for us, what we could not do. Christ did for us, and by our faith in his finished work, brings the blessing to us, whatever we ask. And that's how I say on the line here, when the Holy Spirit begins to move and to give discernment, and that is to bring the presence of God among the people, just like singing a hymn, shouting, a message given in unknown tongues or something, it brings the Spirit of God among the people. You've heard your pastor preach him many times on the Word until the Spirit got among the people and they just screamed out. They could not hold their peace any longer because the Spirit of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That Spirit of God takes the Word of God to the congregation and feeds them and they grow spiritually on that Word. Now that's the Gospel. Then when I one time read in the Bible about hell, and I began to read at the word hell come from the word Hades, which meant the grave. And I was for about three years or four, I would not preach the subject of hell. Because one place it looked like it was a burning fire, the next place was the grave, until I found the truth of it. Then when I got to know exactly what it was, and by the help of the angel of the Lord that revealed it to me, because I did not get any schooling and I just hold on to a scripture and pray and search the scriptures until he comes and reveals it to me, when he stands before me in that light that you see on the picture and reveals it, it every time is perfect with the scripture through and through. That's the reason I know it's the angel of the Lord, because he bears record of his word. And if that angel told me one thing that wasn't scriptural, I would not believe him. It has to be with the word first. God's word is eternal. Because an angel could come and preach something else, Paul said, that wasn't right. But if it's the word of God, the angel of God will verify that word every time to be the truth, if it's a true angel from the Lord. 
If it's something off color, then don't you listen to it. But if an angel comes and speaks and says just exactly what the word says, then that angel's from God. Now, then on this scripture, I could not justify myself to preach on it. How did you notice Jesus said here, Verily I say unto you, If ye shall say to this mountain, Be plucked up and cast into the sea, and don't doubt, but believe in your heart that what you have said shall come to pass, you can have what you said. Now, I could not justify that. Because I could not understand it. How then could it be that I would say something as a man, and then how, what if I said something that wasn't according to his word and asked something wasn't according to his word, then it would have to come to pass. Because Jesus said, if you say, not if I say, but if you say, placing it upon his apostles, Upon the believers, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be moved, and don't doubt in their heart, but believe that what they have said shall come to pass. They can have what you said, not what he said, what you say. Now, to me, that took it away from the atonement and put it up on a person. I could not understand it. And I, it's been about three or four years ago when I run so just reading over it, I noticed that the tree withered and, and I thought just a miracle of God. But yet there was something began to pull at my mind. Have you examined that scripture that you can have what you have said? If you say it and then believe that you have it, you can have what you've said. That puzzled me. I just bypassed that part of the scripture. For I realize this, that I'm responsible to God for what I say before the purchase of his blood. I realize that God will make me answer for it at the day of judgment. Therefore, being sure this humanly possible, before I say anything, I want it to be right. And all through the scriptures to be right. Not just right in one place, but right in every place. It must be the, exactly the same. It must come from Genesis to Revelations the same. If it doesn't, then I might be saying something wrong. So I've got the lexins, the commentaries, the different versions, and even to the Douay version. Everything that I could find in every scripture, the Greek, the Hebrew, all said the same thing. Jesus said it. There's no dispute even through the, through the, the Douay version, which is the, the, Roma, the Catholic Bible, the Douay version. And none of them dispute it, but Jesus said it himself. Whatsoever you say, you can have what you've said. If you don't doubt in your heart, he said, therefore, when you stand praying, when you pray, believe that you receive what you ask for, and it shall be given unto you, if you can believe it. Well, I see it based back to a faith then. So I don't want you to lose any of these words now in this testimony. I want you to hold the scripture with the testimony. Always examine anybody's testimony. Are they preaching by the word? It's got to come from God's word. Then one day, and by a, one of my meetings not long ago, there was a Jehovah Witness brother that had been a little skeptic of the meeting. And when he heard of it, then he came to Louisville. He had a boy that his legs was bent up from polio. But one night he saw a little boy taken from a wheelchair that was so braced up over his hips and one leg was shorter than the other 
the little fellow ran all over the place and jumped up on the platform and preached a sermon. That convinced him. He was a contractor. His name was Wood. Banks Wood, he lives. They were neighbors to me now. He was from Crestwood, Kentucky. Up in Ohio, I had a big tent. He brought his boy and was sitting back in the tent. That night, the Holy Spirit went back into the meeting and said, The man sitting back there, his name is Banks Wood. He's from Crestwood, Kentucky, a contractor, Jehovah Witness by faith. But he has a boy with him by the name of David. It's got polio, one leg's drawn up. Thus saith the Lord, he's healed. He didn't know what to do. In a few moments, the boy's mother said, David, stand up. And when the boy stood up, he was just as normal and perfect as he could be. That convinced him. He stopped carpenter work, contracting, sold everything he had, bought a little house next door to him. He's lived there ever since. And Mr. Bankwood, how many knows him? Why you? Well, many of you know him here. Why from selling books? He sells books in the meetings with me many times. His family, all being Jehovah Witness, very fine people, just the very nicest of people. Honest, their name is above reproach in the state of Kentucky. Fine people. So one of his brothers by the name of Lyle came down to visit him because they excommunicated him upon the basis of his, his uh, faith then in God on divine healing because he said it was of the devil. But the boy was healed. The boy now is a young man married. And he doesn't, he, he, have to, he has to study to see which leg it was that was crippled. And he works for the supermarket, some kind of a buyer or something for the supermarkets, or it just has. And now, this Mr. Lyle came into Mr. Wood's house, and he said, Banks, you know as a brother, we all love you. But said, how come you to go off on a deep end like that? How come to you to listen to some fanatic preacher and to give up the faith that your father has taught you? He said, I haven't give up faith that my father has taught me. I just believe more. He said, I believe that plus what I know now. Well, he said, what kind of a quack did you get mixed up with? He said, there he is out there in the field cutting hay. <laughs> and he said, well, you want to speak to him? He said, yes, I'd like to t talk to him a minute. He said, I'd like to just see what he's made out of. So he called me out there, Mr. Woods did, and I was dirty and <laughs> you know how you'd be and hot and sweaty and overhauls just white with perspiration and where they'd been the day before. He come in, he said, and you're the preacher that tucked Banks on this wild chase. And I said, no, sir, I am not. I said, I'm uh, his brother in Christ who preaches the gospel. And he looked me all up and down a few times. We sat down to talk. Not an unreasonable person, nice. But he said, Mr. Branham said, we were raised strictly Jehovah Witness. Our father is a reader in the Jehovah Witness. I said, that's fine. I'm certainly glad to hear that. And you have a nice name. And I sure appreciate a daddy that would raise you and a mother to be honest and upright people as you are. And um, so while I was there, the Holy Spirit in the goodness of his mercy, a vision came over him. And I said, um, Mr. Wood, I see you're a married man. You have a wife. She's a blonde-headed woman. You have two little boys, about six and eight years old. And he looked around towards Banks real funny. I looked back. I said, you thought Banks had told me that. He has not. I said, perhaps maybe you know this. You have left your wife or you're untrue to her. Last night, you was with a woman that had auburn hair. She's much younger than you are. You were in a place where... She and you were in a room together, and there's a man knocking at the door. You slipped to the window, and it's a good thing you didn't go at the door. You got your head shot off because he had a pistol in his hand, and he fell on the floor. <laughs> you know the banks didn't tell me that. <clears throat> he said, Mr. Ranham, I want to know more about this. <laughs> right there in the room, the Lord Jesus saved him. Away he went to tell his daddy. And his daddy said, now you've got all mixed up. <laughs> so here come his sister down. 
And she attended the first meeting and was converted and her baptized her in the Christian faith. Then that blew the daddy up. Here he come. And so Banks was gone when wife and I had just arrived at the house and there was a car sitting down the road and an elderly man standing in the yard. And so we spoke to him and he said, I'm Mr. Wood. And I said, yes, sir. I said, uh, my name is Branham. I said, I'm glad to meet you. And he said, well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Branham. I said, you know where Banks is? And I said, he's probably going to the grocery. This is usually our time to go. And he and his wife's going, won't you come in? And so he said, no, I better stay right out here. I said, well, come in, have a glass of water and refresh yourself. Banks will be in a few minutes. In a few moments, he come in and he said, I want to go fishing with you. Have you got time to go fishing? I said, oh, sure. I want to work on him. So he said, um, well, the next that night it rained like everything. And then the next day we went down to said, well, I don't guess there's any need going. The streams will all be muddy. And I said, well, we can go try. We crossed the river and as praying for the Lord to help me, I wasn't going to say one thing about religion. Let him name it. And so then if he's hungering, he'll mention it. So then when we crossed the river, I saw vision. And I said, Mr. Woods, that you might know, I said, today, every stream that we pass will be muddy. And I said, then when we get down to the lake that we're going, it'll be pretty and blue. We shall fish till about 3.30 this afternoon without catching any fish. Then I'm going to start catching fish. I'm going to catch about 50 pounds. You're going to catch one. Your boy Lyle will catch one. We'll stop fishing at midnight. The next morning, we go back to fishing again. I'll catch a large scale fish. These fish they'll catch will be blue cat. And the next will be a large scale fish. Then we'll fish the rest of the day and won't even get a bite. That's thus saith the Lord. He looked over the banks and kind of grinned a little and looked around. That's just exactly the way it happened. And when he left that night, after the second night, we fished all day, and that man climbed every bank that he could to try to make a fish bite, and he couldn't even get another bite. And I had about 25 pounds of fish, caught two of them, five and eight pounds apiece on a little number four hook without a landing net. I, I, that had to be God, if anybody knows about fishing. <laughs> and he's sitting there watching. He kind of talks down in his throat, and his son said to him the next day, he said, well, Dad, what do you think about it? He said, well, I guess if anybody can see fish before they catch them, I guess that's all right. <laughs> and so um, I said, but I can't do that always, Mr. Wood. It was for your sake. I said, now, without any disregards, the Bible said, if there be one among you who's prophet or spiritual, if this one prophesies and what he says comes to pass, then hear it. I said, no disregard to Mr. Rutherford. But he said Christ would come in 14, then he turned off spiritual, which he come that way on the day of Pentecost. Now, the other four things that he missed, I said, what about this? And I baptized him about three Sundays ago, him and his wife, in the Christian faith. His son and I returned back to two sons to come to this spot now. And we'd been fishing again about a few weeks after that. We'd been fishing down in Dale Holler again. And that night we caught a nice string of fish, but had run out of bait. And we were standing, throwing our fly lines in, catching a little bluegill to bait with them. And uh, Mr. Bankswood said to Mr. Lylewood, which both of them was brothers, said, we ought to go over here to some old lady, she's about 90 years old, said, when we were little Jehovah Witness boys, we used to go around there and she'd give us bread and butter. You remember that old homemade bread? said, we are to go to tell her that we are saved. That was the right thing. Now, this, please try to catch this. It's just the way you say things sometimes that changes the whole setup. They said just the right thing. For just then the Holy Spirit dropped upon me from the heavens somewhere. And I said, thus saith the Lord. And friends, I've got people that's been here with me since a little boy from the city that I come from. I ask anybody, any place at any time, if they ever heard that prophecy made or any prophecy, but what come to pass just exactly the way it was said. Okay. 
on record anywhere. How many knows that to be true? Raise up your hands. It knows it's the truth. Sure. It's, it's exactly because it's God. If it was me, it would fail every time. But if it's Him, it can never fail. It cannot fail. Well, they said, what do you think it will be? I said, there will be a resurrection of a little life, of some kind of a little animal. I said, I didn't see just what the animal was, but it was something that sprung to life all at once. And we had been talking on this scripture. And then I thought, well, it must be a little cat that my little boy, I think, had killed. We were kind of a little afraid of cats at our house. And my little girl came by one afternoon, she and little Rebecca, and another little girl next door, and they had a, an old mother cat, and they wanted to keep it. And I, had, I told them, all right, and they put it in the box. And the next morning, we had about eight or ten little kittens. And, and so my little Joseph, he's about two years old then, and he wanted to see one of them. The little fellows didn't have their eyes open. And, he just picked it up and looked at it and squeezed it and threw it down. So the poor little fella just wiggled around just as we was leaving. And I thought, that's maybe time I get home, the Lord will raise that little cat up like he did the mother possum. You've heard that story because it went throughout the world. So then I said, that um, maybe that little kitten will be what will come to life. I thought that in my heart, but I didn't say nothing. We fished that night and the next morning we didn't, hadn't caught any fish that night. That night on our lines because we'd changed the bait to them bluegill and they wasn't biting on that. And about the time it got daylight, we had all of our trot lines run. We pulled into a little cove and we were fishing with the fly lines for the big brim. That's a little larger bluegill. So we were fishing for those brim on fly line and Mr. Lylewood had a, a reeling pole and he just dropped it in the water with a great big long hook and a poor little bluegill had swallowed it plumb down in the bottom of his little belly. And, and he pulled it up and he said, I wish you'd look at there. You can't even see the hook. And he just grabbed the fish like this and just pulled the entrails, gills and all out of it. And throw it down on the water like that to get his hook out of it. And the little fish quivered four or five times and spread his little fins out and died laying there on the water. So uh, he said, little fellow, you shot your last wad. And... Um, we went on. I said, Lyle, you don't, shouldn't take the hook out like that. I was trying to tell him I said, put a smaller hook on. And he was just a farmer boy, you know, it never had fish very much. And so <clears throat> the little fish laid there for about a half hour and the wind got up and blowed it back into the drift along some lilies along the side of the bank. And we was fishing and I was catching, we was catching some pretty nice fish. And all of a sudden something happened. Now, I'm speaking these words with this Bible open. Something happened and uh, like a, a, a coming down of, a, of anointing that I had never felt like that. And I, something said, stand up. And I stood up. And Lyle and Banks dropped their poles and looked. Lyle said, what's the matter with him? Banks said, watch. Something's fixing to happen. And something said to me, Speak to that little fish, and he'll live again. The gills is white. It's hanging out of its mouth. I said, little fishy, Jesus Christ gives you your life. And God in heaven, who's my solemn judge, that fish turned over and swam down through that water as hard as he could go. And Mr. Lyle Wood just fell right over into the boat. He said, that was for me because I said to the little fella, you shot your last one. And I said, no, it wasn't that. And I said, now the strange thing to me is this, that how God, the great Jehovah God, would use his power to bring a little old fish where we'd cut up two or three hundred of them the night before, but would use his power to bring that fish to life and I've got at least 300 spastic children on the list up there praying for him to see a vision for them around 300 spastic children I said that's one thing that I I, I can't understand how God would do such a thing as that on that little old fish and human beings laying dying cancer cases leukemia 
all kinds of sickness around the world from everywhere. And then he would bring to life that little fish. Just about that time, something's at a Mark 11, 23. Same scripture. When lepers was laying all over the country, sickness laying everywhere, and God used his power to curse a tree. God's concerned about the tree, about the fish. Everything belongs to God. And he is showing his power to show that he's God over the trees. He's God over the fish. And the little fish came to life. I just couldn't catch that. Still this scripture hanging with me. How could it be? Fred Southman, a friend of mine, bosom friend from Canada. He shared a meeting somewhere. Was with me in a New England campaign just last year. And we went over in the Adirondack where I was lost at that time and the only time I was ever lost in the woods in my life. And I wanted to show Brother Fred where my wife and children, was, or Billy, was waiting for me to come back when I was lost in that snowstorm that night. And when we were standing there by the side of a little lean-to where it had Mita and Billy laying in this lean-to while I was hunting bear. Well, I stepped out to one side and the Spirit of the Lord came up on me and I began to shake. And it said, the Spirit of the Lord said, there is a trap set for you. And be thou careful what you say. Fred, where are you at? Are you in the meeting here tonight? I know you come over... Yeah, right back here. That's right. And we left there and I told Brother Southman, something's fixing to happen. And when we got to the meeting that night, I said to the audience, remember, thus saith the Lord, there is a trap set for me. And all of you pray that I'll know to do the right thing when this comes to pass. And the next night, it happened. The devil sent in two people, a young boy and girl, to break up the meeting. And that was in, uh, uh, it was in, uh, not New Hampshire, but Vermont. Freddie, you remember the name of the city? It was the capital what, uh, um, of Vermont. And we were just across Lake Champlain. And so when we were in the meeting, this boy, the girl looked like kind of a Mongolian girl, but the boy was just holding, they were both at least 25 years old apiece, but such immoral acts in a church. They were sitting about like this from me. And when I started preaching, he would just grab her and throw her head back and climb up on her and kiss her and carry on and just act awful in the meetings. And the ushers couldn't make him be quiet. And I said to him on the platform, I said, Young man, don't do that. You're attracting the attention while I'm preaching. And he just laughed right out at me. I thought, "Uh uh-oh, there it is. There's a trap right there. I went right ahead speaking just the same. And oh, he got so immoral with her till I had to stop again. I said, don't do that, sir, please. I said, if you want to make love to the young lady, then you leave the building. But this is a a religious meeting. I said, you shouldn't do that. Don't, please don't do that while I'm preaching. I started again and he just made it worse. And then when I started, I said, don't. And something said to me, say what you will. And it'll be done. I stood there. Mr. Mercer, the tape boy, and all of them standing, Brother Fred, Many of them standing present. The perspiration is just running from me. Something said, say blindness, it'll be blind. Say death and they'll pack them out. Say what you will. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. And it just left. I thought, God, what, what must I do? And I turned and he stood there and his face white looking at me. I thought... What must I say? Then I turned and looked like before I know what I said. I said, I forgive you of your act. And it must have been just the right thing to say. It was God trying a 
a reaction on an action. That night it was revealed to me that I'd said the right thing. I know it was all leading to something, but what was it? What to do? You know, you have to watch with the divine gift what you do with it. Remember what Moses did? So I must have said the right thing. I forgive you. For you know, John, young John, wanted to burn up Samaria one time because he wouldn't feed him. Jesus said, you don't know what kind of a spirit you are. The Son of Man came to save life, not to destroy it. And I, them scriptures just kept pouring over all night. I didn't sleep. But that was a trap set that Satan would get me all worked up and then make me say the wrong thing. But the Holy Spirit was there and told me beforehand to be careful what I said. Oh, the goodness of God. How it was. It just is mercy. Be careful what you said. And from that on, there was a relief come. Then about, I begin to notice the different things that I would speak out unconsciously, not knowing what I said, and it would happen that way. I begin to speak about it. One day, this last fall, a few weeks ago, taking a little rest before coming to this meeting, I was squirrel hunting. Now, in our country, that's a rabbit and squirrels about all they hunt. And the reason that I was doing that was to get some relaxation before coming to this meeting. Mr. Sothman was with me that morning. He's come from Canada to visit us and stay with us a while. Got him a trailer and living close to us. He and some more friends. And so we were squirrel hunting together with Mr. Wood. And also he just lives there by the side of me and just a chum to be along with me. And then we went hunting and it was the last day that I would get to hunt because I was staged to go to Wyoming the coming Sunday, and then the season would close on Tuesday, and then this was on a Saturday, and be the last time I could hunt in the state of Indiana for squirrels this season. Oh, we'd hunted quite a bit, and there'd been much hunting. There's many hunters there in Indiana for the squirrels. It's all thinned out. That morning was a bad morning, windy, wind blowing, and they just won't come out on those days. And I went into the woods, and I walked till about nine o'clock, could see nothing. Went down on the creek bank. It's turning real cold in Indiana then. About the 1st of October, I think it would be exactly, it was the 8th of October. And I went down to some old sycamore trees. And squirrels don't live in sycamore trees. They stay in beech and oak and so forth, the thick timber where there's a lot of foliage. And I was walking down a creek and I thought I'd seen a squirrel up on the side of a little ridge and there's corn fields out there and the car farmers were gathering their corn. Many of them out there gathering corn. Well, I said, there's no squirrels this morning and over here is nothing but a big locust thicket, which is nothing there for a squirrel. The old walnut trees, the leaves all gone, they were bare and there were no squirrels to be there. And I said, well, I suppose I'll just sit down here a little bit, kind of warm up because I just had a shirt on and no coat. And I sit down between the two trees where the sun would shine on me, slip my feet up on the other tree, and I was in a, quite a comfortable position. I thought, maybe I'll take a little nap. I have a little alarm watch, and I thought I'll set that watch now to alarm if I happen to go to sleep. And I'll pick up Mr. Wood and Mr. Sothman at the appropriate time, because they were farther on the road in another woods. So I set my little clock, and and my little watch rather and sat down in the, by this tree and just as I scooted down to kind of get myself warm that scripture came to me again whatsoever you say believe that what you say shall come to pass and you can have what you say well I thought why does that scripture keep coming to me when I can't preach on it because I don't know nothing about it I could not go before a congregation and try to explain that scripture. Well, I sat there a little bit, and I thought there's only one thing to it. If I'm ever called on to preach on that subject, here's the way I'll do it. I'll say, Jesus told that to the disciples and gave them that authority. That was about a year and six months before the atonement was made. So if it wasn't in the atonement, it was the other side of the atonement. So if anybody ever asks me that question, I'll just tell them it was the other side of the atonement. It's the only thing I know. Because Jesus is still a living. 
The atonement was not made and he was not wounded for our transgression or by his stripes were we healed yet. So he just gave them that power, the other side of the atonement. And then all of a sudden, something spoke to me and said, what about the prophets? Well, I begin to see then, it began to unfold to me. What do you think that taken place in the meeting when you're standing there? Do you think you're the one who knows those people? Do you think that it's you that can predict and say to those people that you're going to do a certain, certain thing and a certain, certain thing that has happened to you and a certain, certain thing will happen to you? Do you think that's you saying it? Oh, my it, my, it means so much. It's never left me. And I thought, surely not, Lord. It's you. Well, then, do you think it's you talking? No. Do you think it was the prophets talking? Have not you just got to preaching on a subject that the prophets was so anointed with the Holy Spirit that it wasn't them that done the speaking? It was the Holy Spirit in them crying out. Then whatever you say, if you're anointed, wouldn't be you saying it. It would be the Holy Spirit saying it. Well, I thought if that may, that's right. If the person through the atonement, sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, can live into a sphere with God so close that he can be wrapped so completely in God by the blood of Jesus that it wouldn't be him talking, it would be the Holy Spirit speaking these things. And no more than I'd said that, the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit struck me like I have never had before in all my life. God knows that. I raised up to my feet. I got scared. And something said to me, now, this is the beginning of your new ministry. Now, ask what you will, and it shall be given to you. I stood there. I, I don't want to be a fanatic. I, God knows I want to be sane and just and honest and faithful and true. When I, I'm 50 years old, can't be too much longer. I've got to go meet him. And I want to be, know that everything is perfectly right before I leave this world. And I thought, uh, I don't want to be off on a deep end of something. I thought maybe I'd, now I, I bite my finger, I said, I'm not asleep, I'm not dreaming this. So something's wrong. And I was real numb, like all over my face and everything. I thought maybe I was just studying it so much till I, I got into a place I can't shake myself out of it. And I thought, usually when anointing comes deeply, a vision follows it. I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just wait a minute. And I, and I started moving my hands around like this and walking around. And something said, say what you will and it shall be given to you. I waited and listened. I thought, was that, where are you at, it, sir? I heard it again. Ask what you will. And it shall be given unto you. I'm confirming the things that I will do. And I said, but what should I? I thought, who am I talking to? I, I felt like I'd lost my mind. I thought, who am I talking to? I don't see a person. Where's that light at? It uses one talk. There's no light here. Who are you? What do you want? I thought something said, ask what you will. That's right, I was thinking of that scripture, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Ask what you will. I thought, well, what would I ask? There's no sick people here. What could I do? I thought, there's nothing. Maybe, am I beside myself? I said, what would I ask for? And something just as plain as you hear my voice saying, aren't you hunting? And you have no game? I said, that's right. I thought, this, Lord, I said, if I'm, if I'm doing anything wrong, you forgive me. Now, isn't that awful? If you're doing anything wrong. 
I said, Lord, if I'm doing anything wrong, forgive me. But is this you? Is this the scripture that you're trying to get to me? Is this that other step that we're coming up to? You give me a vision and set me confirmed in a little building somewhere in the meeting when the tents get started. I said, is this what it's leading to? If it is, Lord, then I'll take you by your word. I looked around. I thought I'll find something impossible. I found that old locust ticket. I said, I usually set my sights in for 50 yards. I, the Lord, I'm not a shot, but I, I, if my gun won't drive a tack at 50 yards, it's out. So then I was... Um, I shoot squirrels, never shoot one of these back turned or head turned. I got to see him just right and shoot him in the eye with a 22 rifle. Now, if I don't, let him go. So then, and I said, there's 50 yards about the distance across this building. I said, and there shall come a young red squirrel and set on that old naked limb out there and I'll shoot him from right here. And there come the squirrel. I turned the gun, aimed up. Through the little telescope side, I seen its eye, shot it, dropped down. I walked over to look at it, I thought, it's bleeding, a vision don't bleed. And I, I looked at it, picked the squirrel up, felt it as a real squirrel. I got real scared. And I thought, well, you know, it just happened, that's all. It just happened like that. So I started to walk away, and I thought, but a squirrel out here in this locust thicket? Well, they'd be back over here in the woods. They wouldn't walk out there like that. I've been hunting all morning. So I stood there just a little bit. And I said, Lord, if that was you, the Bible said two or three witnesses of confirmation. It can't happen the second time. So I walked up side of the hill and sat down. And I said, now here I'm acting crazy. And I said, well, I, I'll just get ready and go home now. I said, but I thought... I believe I'll try. And I said, and there shall come another squirrel and sit over there in that bunch of grapevines right there. I tucked my finger down, looked back. I didn't see any squirrel. I said, well, look back. And I thought, what is that there? Pulled up my telescope and there said a squirrel looking right at me. Fifty yards away, I shot the squirrel. Walked over, picked him up, see if it's a vision. But it, it wasn't a vision. It was a squirrel. I eat them. So they, and I, I picked up that one and I thought, oh my, I just felt real funny. I thought two, but you said three. Well, I said this, I, I, I kind of believe it was you, Lord. I said, maybe you're going to do something for the people now. You're going to help your people. So I thank you very much. And I, I thank you, sir. I took off my hat and I said, I, I certainly thank you, sir. I, I believe you now and you're going to do something for your people. So I, I sure appreciate it, Father dear. And I said, now, I'll be going home. He said, but you said you wanted three. Well, I said, yes. Now, that seemed like it's something inside of me. I didn't hear a voice, but just something inside of me said that. Well, I thought I'll make this one so radical that it'll have to be something supernatural. And I looked out in the field, towards the field, is just a big old slick snag out there with one big old limb run out. And I said, and it shall come to pass, there will be a young squirrel. Go out on that limb, sit on the end of the limb, and look over at the farmers cutting their corn, shucking their corn, and I'll kill him from this tree right here. It shall be that way. I stood there a minute, no squirrel, looked back, about five minutes past, no squirrel. Well, I said, I thought, uh, well, this is enough. Anyhow, it's getting time for me to go. I said, I better go. And I started to walk away. And as I did, something said, but you've already spoken. And the scripture says, if you'll not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I waited up against the side of a tree. I looked off, looked back. And no squirrel, I waited another 10 minutes, no squirrel. I said, how could a squirrel ever get out there? So I said, well, I guess I'll just move along and I'll be going on because it's time to pick up Mr. Southman and them. So I'll just walk on. I started to walk away like that. said, are you doubting? God knows how to school you. Are you doubting that what you said? I said, no, I'm not doubting. And just as I said that, Coming out that limb come a young squirrel. 
walked out to the end of the limb and stood and looked over at the farmers. I shot him from right there, making my three squirrels. And I said, I'm going to see if there's another squirrel in this territory. And I was about three hours late picking up Mr. Sop and them couldn't even hear one. I went home. I told him. It bothered me. I didn't know what to think about it. About two weeks later, I was down in the state of Kentucky where squirrel season was still in with friends of mine, Mr. Woods and his brother-in-law. And I was standing down there and we went hunting that morning and all windy and the leaves all off the trees, a bad time to squirrel hunt. So we, good hunters, wasn't catching over about one a day and, and uh, you had to be, have a shotgun to get them with it then and be hunting. And you shall have them. I thought, now here, I don't, I don't know about that now. It's too unlikely this morning, sure enough. And not no squirrels in here at this time of year. And it's so cold. We had on so many clothes. I just shivered as hard as I could. I thought, no squirrels and leaves about that deep on the ground. You could hear you like a, a herd of antelope coming through. And so I was walking along like that. And it struck me again and said, ask what you will. And I stopped and put my gun down, took off my hat. And I said, Heavenly Father, I'm down here in these mountains. What, what's these things about? Is that you speaking to me? Is it you, Lord? Where are you at? I usually see that your light. Where are you at? Speak to me, Lord. If there's anything you want me to do, I'll do it. Have I found grace in your sight? I said, I, you speak to me and said, ask what you will and it'll be given to you. I said, then if that be you, I shall have my three squirrels this morning, gray squirrels. That's reds in Indiana. And I said, I shall have my three squirrels. Something said, which way will they come from? I thought, there it is. I could hear it just as plain as you hear me. And I said, one will come from this way, one will come from back that way, and one will come from that way. I leaned up against the little tree and waited a few minutes. I didn't see any squirrels. Getting late, time to go back almost. I looked back across the hill and way up, about 125 yards, I guess, I seen something look like it was on a stump. A gray squirrel's very small. I looked through the little telescope and I couldn't tell it was a squirrel or not. I kept watching it jumped off the stump, started down beside a tree. Well, that's an awful long shot. But I just knelt down on my knee and laid my gun across the side of my hand. Kill the squirrel. I said, that then, the next one will have to come from this way. So I just turned myself on the tree and I said, it'll come this way. I waited about 15 minutes. Here come a squirrel. So I throwed another shell up in the gun and leveled down. Just to start level down, the second squirrel come. I said, oh, praise the Lord. There's the second one. There they are. So I raised up, shot the first one, killed him right dead, hit him right through the eye. And then and this other squirrel run, jumped up on a log and run under the log, picked up a hickory nut and started eating it. Just a perfect shot, about 50 yards. I thought, there's my second squirrel. That's one, two, three. Just what I asked for. I laid my gun down and shot. I hit the log. Now, of about 149 squirrels this year, I've only missed five shots. So then I thought, how did I miss that squirrel? Never scared him. He jumped up, run back down to the other side of the log, and stood and looked around. I put another shell in. I thought, I'll sure get him this time. I leveled down right across the hair, right across his eye, pulled the trigger. I hit about two foot under him. I said, my, this gun's out. There's something wrong with this gun, not thinking. And... Then he jumped off the log and run right broadsided from me. I said, well, I haven't shot a squirrel sideways in a long time, but I'm going to see if this gun's out or not. I said, I'll certainly get him this time. Maybe I'm this cold and shaking. So I got a little bush and leaned the gun against the bush and leveled down to the right broadsided, not over about 35 yards away, the squirrel would run down the hill, right across the mid center of me, pull the trigger, and I don't know where I hit and missed the squirrel. And I was out of shells, my little old gun, so the squirrel went up over the hill. And I thought, there I missed three straight shots in the whole season through and only missed five. How could it be that I happened to think, I couldn't have got that squirrel. I said the other one would come from this way. Two of them is there. But his word is perfect. See? Amen. Then I started waiting. 
almost dark. I said, if the other squirrel comes, I'm going to have to shoot him real close to me because there's a thicket here. And he has to come down through this thicket the only way he can. Well, I thought, well, it wasn't so this time. Uh, that, that anointing, maybe, maybe I just happened to get those two. So I went over and picked my squirrels up and started home. It's real dark in the holler. And it started down through the holler. Something said to me, what about that other squirrel? And I said, well, I, I, I've already got two. And so it's too late now. I can't even see through my scope hardly, see? Too late to get one now. And I started on down. Something said, turn and go back and get the other squirrel. You've already said it. So I turned and I hadn't walked about 10 steps. I listened close. And I seen a squirrel up the tree about 60 or 70 yards from me. So dark, it had to be just a light across the top of the mountain or I wouldn't have seen him. And I, I leveled the gun down. I couldn't see the squirrel. Kept looking back and forth. And I thought, where's he at? That's why it looked like a knot on the tree stuck around. I thought, that's his head. So I shot the squirrel run down the tree and I heard something hit the leaves. I thought he must have jumped off. And about that time, about 15 yards from it, another squirrel run up a tree. I said, that was that squirrel. I missed him. He ran around right up that tree. So I watched real close. It's so dark and the wind blowing so hard. I thought I seen some leaves, but something moving. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to shoot at it anyhow. And I shot. I heard that squirrel hit the ground. Plunk. It really killed him right out. Well, I said, I missed him on that tree. I got him over here just a little bit out of line. I said, I'll go over and get him. So I walked on up the hill. And when I got to this first tree, there lay my squirrel. The first one. Right in line, exactly where I pointed. God in heaven knows that's true. Right the way I pointed. Well, I went over. I said, well, that makes me four. He gave me one for a good measure. That's good. I said, I said three and I got four. That's good. So I went over to pick up the other squirrel. And it wasn't there. And yet I know I'd kill that squirrel. Well, I searched everything around there, waiting, feeling with my hands in the darkness through the leaves and busted open an old log and everything. Thought he might have just hurt him and he pulled away. Finally, I found a little hole in the snag. I began to run my stick in there and pull around. I feel something fall off. And I said, it's the squirrel, but the hole was too little to get my hands in. I have to get an axe or something to cut it. So I put a big rock or a chunk against it and Went on down, and I told my brethren when it got to the bottom of the hill, they began to praise the Lord and shout. That night, I was telling once a group of mountain people had come gathered in, and we were all praising the Lord. And one of my deacons, by the name of Tony, that's in my church, he was, um, he was with me. And that night when we started to go to bed, he prayed before those people. He said, Now, Lord, we asked him to lead in prayer. He said, Now, Lord, to confirm that our brother has told the truth. Let him find that squirrel tomorrow in the log so we'll know he's told the truth. It looked like my heart just dropped out of me. Know that I've told the truth or something like that and would tell a lie about it? God forbid, such a hypocrite. And I thought, how would a man that loves me and a man of that caliber a man that his wife lay dying on the floor and the doctors had walked away from her, went over and offered prayer for her. She got up and went to church with me. How could he question my word? How did he say that? And the other brethren caught it. The next morning at the table early before daylight, he said, well, Brother Branham, we'll go up and get your squirrel. We'll get one today anyhow because it'll be in there. I said, Brother Tony, you just didn't understand. But when I spoke under the inspiration, I said three squirrels. That fourth one had nothing to do with it. Oh, he said he's in that log anyhow. We'll know by that. I looked across the table and I thought, Brother Tony, would you, would you doubt me telling you the truth? And I never said anything. The brethren looked at each other. And we went on to the woods. And when we started to leave the cars for different ways, well, I thought I'd go up and get my squirrel if he was there. And I thought I'd go back and tell Brother Tony. But something just kept pressing me on. I went on to... Now, that was just about a week before I come here. And I went on... To, up and when I got started up there, something said to me, "What if that squirrel isn't in there? Now what? There, your own deacon will say that it's not right." Now the Lord knows these words are true, exactly, perfectly, to the best of my knowledge in my heart. And I started walking on. I thought, "Well, I sure hope it's there. That's one thing, sure. I certainly hope it. I've never said nothing about that squirrel. It was you all understand. How many understand what it, what it was about?" Sure. The three squirrels is what I had spoke about. The fourth one had nothing to do with it. But the Lord knows how to train and what to do. So going on up there, that anointing struck me again. 
and said, if it isn't there, say it'll be there and you'll find the squirrel. I said, Lord, I'm taking your word now. I said, and I shall find the squirrel. On up the mountain I went. I thought, don't even be feared anymore because I'm going to find it. That's all. I done said it. And the Lord said, when that anointing was on me, when I said anything, it'll be that way. So I'm going on. I hunted all around. I looked about 15 minutes time to get back down the mountain. I thought, I better go get my squirrel. I went up there and pulled a chunk out of the hole. Begin to feel in there. I could feel that. Pick it up and feel like something fall off. Like that, like the squirrel on the end of the stick and fall off. I had a big old hunting knife and got me a, a big rock and cut the hole big enough get my hand in and look down there. I was picking up some roots. <laughs> it was falling. Some roots under, uh, was laying in this old snag. I thought, oh my. <laughs> and we're supposed to be there exactly nine o'clock. So I now with no squirrel. And oh my, that morning was terrible. It was a blizzard and going on. And I thought, that's terrible. So I thought, well, there's only one thing I can do to prove it. I, it Lord, it wasn't your fault. Because you, when I, you told me that to speak and I spoke for those three and the three was there but brother Tony just misunderstood it that's all and I said I'm going back down and pick him up and the other brother and bring him here and show him where this where the stump was and let him know that I I, li- I thought it was right I told the truth about knowing the squirrel was there and I put it started down the hill and something said to me but you said coming up that you'd find the squirrel amen <laughs> Oh, you just don't know how that does to me. You said you shall find the squirrel. I thought, where could I find him? Here's the woods, not a leaf on a tree, and they're all piled up around here. There's the tree where the squirrel fell. Here's just one thing he could have hid under, been this log, and I've tucked every little piece away from it. Not another hole in a tree, nowhere, and there's the only place. But he said, you said you would find it. Well, I kicked around in the leaves and everything. I thought, oh, Billy, you went off. I believe it's a deep end. And I started going on down. I started, said, but you said you would find it. I thought, that's right. I said when that anointing was on me, I shall find the squirrel. And if that's a confirmation of my ministry beginning again, then the squirrel's got to be here somewhere. Amen. I said, I can't find it. Where's it at? Something said, look under that piece of bark. And I went and picked, started to pick. I said, yes, praise the Lord. It's under the bark. And I went over to pick up the piece of bark. And something said, but what if it isn't under there? <laughs> oh, I said, it'll be under there. And I picked it up and there was no squirrel. And I thought there's something funny. Now, but I said that's the same inspiration. It told me the three would be there. The same inspiration was on me when I said that would be there. So it's got... I looked down there again. I seen just a little couple of little gray hair sticking out from under the leaves. I picked it up and there was my squirrel. Now you talk about a little Irishman shouting. You ought to have heard me going down that hill. I really was a happy boy. I went home and told the folks about it and my how we all rejoiced. And Brother Tony said, Brother Branham, I didn't know I prayed that way. And I said, but you did. And Brother Charlie and Emma was talking about how that he, he did pray that way. So... The set, then the day before I come here to the, to the meeting, we left Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon, I was down to a man's house that's got a crippled girl. And she's been bound of polio since she was a little girl. And she's about 30 years old. Oh, the most afflicted child you've ever seen. I've prayed for her several times. Seen cripples almost like her heels sitting right by her. Fine family of people. If I had time to tell you the story of her father when the doctors had turned him uh, down four doctors passed by. I said, there's not a chance. I'll give him up, prayed and asked the Lord to take him. Went home, saw a vision and it's a preacher there laughing at him because he's believing in divine healing. He told me, tell Mr. Wright that thus saith the Lord, he'll dig the grave of that preacher's laughing at him. And he did. And he's living today, healthy and happy. And the things that's happened, but that little afflicted girl sitting there, I never could understand it. Why it couldn't give me a vision for that girl. We were, Mr. Woods and I were eating dinner there and I went down. He makes a communion wine for the tables at the church. I went down to pick it up. And this little girl said to me, she said, Brother Branham, would you get me a rabbit before you go back? And I said, sure, Edith. Brother Woods, and I'll go out and get you a rabbit. And we picked up the 
gun and went out and was gone a little while and got two rabbits and come back. Mrs. Wright had dinner ready for us. Now her daughter is a widow woman. They're poor. You just don't know how poor they are. You people around here in California don't know what poor people is till you get into something like that. She lives in a little two-room shanty way up the head of the hill. Her husband was killed two years ago on his own tractor, an alcoholic, turned over and broke his neck. And the little boy found him, and she got two teenage children, is kind of going astray with no father. And that poor little old woman, quiet, humble little Christian, oh, I never heard her raise her voice in her life, and she was a... Uh, digging on them old hills up there, raising that old crawfish ground, uh, uh, trying to raise a little patch of corn to take care of those children. Oh, such a pitiful sight. And we were sitting at the table talking, and they just loved me. They got a room up there. I just call my room when I go there. I used to pastor the Baptist church there at Milltown, and so I just had a room where I would stay with the rights. And I said, talking about visions, I said, now, you know, I told them about what would happen. I said, now, like... It has to have something. The only thing I know will have, to, if it ever happens like that, it'll be a faith that God will have to give me. Because when that anointing comes on me, there just seems like a super faith, I said, rises up in me. Something that's just not a shadow of doubt. And I said, oh, how I trust. I said, just like I've been having visions. When the Lord would tell me in a vision, go do a certain thing, a certain, why my, there would be no question in my mind, just go do it. Never fails, so it's just got to happen. See, you've got to believe that what you're doing, you've got to have faith and confidence. And I have in the visions, when the vision, listen, this may sound radical, but if the Lord God, who's here on this platform now, and can tell the secret of every heart in here, or tell you what will be or what won't be. You know that you sit night after night. If he'd tell me that George Washington was going to rise from the grave tomorrow out of the National Cemetery, I'd invite the whole world to come see it done. That's exactly right. I believe him. He's never failed me, and I've seen vision since I was 18 months old. And not one time has it ever failed, and it never will. Because it's God. And so then... I was talking like that, and I said, now if the Lord would tell me a certain thing, it happened like little, your little crippled sisters sitting here, little Edith, and they were poor people, but I was welcome, had a old, big old bowl of beans, pinto beans, baked with cornbread and sliced onions, and can I eat that? Mm. So I was raised on it, and I was uh, just eating away and having a good time, and Mother Wright had baked me a big cherry cobbler, you know, and out of the little tree that... I used to help her pick it out of there. Mr. Wright's in his 80s, and she's 70-something, that afflicted girl. So I, I'd just do anything for those people I could. Poor, and was talking about building the new church up there, the tabernacle, and, and Mr. Wright said to me, how's the pledges coming on up the tabernacle? I said, Brother Wright, I'm not there enough to know. And said, you know what? Said, Hattie wanted to pl- pledge $50 towards that church, and Brother Roberson, the, the trustee of the church, one of them, the chairman wouldn't let her give it said because it'd take her about six months to dig fifty dollars out of them hills over there and said but she give 20 and brother Branham she wants I thought you know what I, I got twenty dollars here in my pocket meaty give it to me pick up some eggs I said I'll just give her that 24 I'll leave back and just she's away from here and you'll never know it so I'd I'd bought her ice boxes and things cause I felt so sorry for her up there that little old mother trying to work away on that hill and so I thought, I'll just give her these, this $20 is what I'll do. When I leave, I'll just slip it so she'll get it. And that's her $20 she paid in on the church up there. So I thought, I'll just give her that. So when I said, something said to me, but uh, your Lord stood one day by the side of a, a wall and seen rich men putting thousands of dollars into a treasury. And a little widow come by and she only had three pennies all her living. And now what would you have done if you had stood there? You'd seen that little widow put them three pennies in. You'd run and said, oh, no, sister, don't do that. Don't do that. Because we got plenty in here. We don't need that. But Jesus never told her not to do it. He let her go ahead and do it. Because he knew he had something far down the road. (laughs) A little something better, you see. So he just let her. God loves a cheerful giver. So I said, well, I'll just keep my money in my pocket then, see. That's all right then. I'll just let it go because maybe the Lord... And we're sitting there and I said, now, these visions that come, now listen close now, we're fixing to close to something else. 
Now remember, this has been less than two weeks ago. Or just about two weeks ago. And I said, the thing that puzzles me, Brother Woods, and he was sitting like here for the side of me, still at the table, a little old porch of a thing out there, had been, had been screened in, they walled it in to try to make a, another room out of it, an old clapboard shingles and houses, holes all through it. And I said, um, uh, what's bothered me always has been this. On those squirrels, I said, where, Brother Woods, I said, we're supposed to be good squirrel hunters. I've hunted since I was a little boy. And I said, and you're an expert hunter. And I said, since little boys, we've hunted squirrels. Under those conditions, Brother Woods, where did those squirrels come from? I said, I can't never figure it out. I was standing right there looking over the grounds. And I said, there shall be a squirrel right there. And I've been sitting there for 45 minutes. And no more than I took my finger down, there was a squirrel. And each time it was that way. The squirrel come from nowhere. And I said, the only thing I can think it to be would be this. When God was trying to tell Abraham what, how he was going to bless him. I said, if this be my new ministry that's coming in, something greater that he will finally confirm in that little building. I said, if it be that, like Abraham, the thing that Abraham needed was a sacrifice instead of his son. And Genesis 22. And then when God held his hand from sacrifice, his son, there was a ram there. Where did that ram come from? He was a hundred miles from civilization, three days back, a journey. Any man can walk 25 miles a day. I walk 30 and 35 lots of times. And today we travel by car and, and so forth. Them days, their whole way of travel is either by riding a donkey or, or walking. And he was three days back and then lifted up his eyes and saw the mountain far off. And besides that, he's up on top of the mountain where there was no water. And what would the ram be doing up there? And it had been killed by wild beasts if it had been away from civilization. Where did the ram come from? That's the reason Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. He's able to speak it into existence. I said, if the Lord was confirming my ministry there to let me know that he's going to help his people and let me do it. I said, then the same Jehovah Jireh, I was in need of a squirrel the same as he is in need of a ram. And I believe Jehovah Jireh placed it there. By same spoken word. It wasn't me anyhow. Because I didn't know what I was saying. He said it himself. And little old quiet sister Hattie. Sitting back our little dust bonnet on like the country women wear there. And she put on a little clean dress to come over to help her mother cook me at dinner. And she was sitting with her hand like this. And she said, that's nothing but the truth. She said the right thing. Here's my Bible. And as a servant of God, I say this. I could hardly hear the last she said. Her mother was trying to say something, but I didn't get it. Uh, just as she said that, she said the right thing. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, Tell her to ask what she will, and you give it to her. I, I couldn't speak. That room, everybody felt strange. I said, Sister Hattie. She said, yes, Brother Branham. I said, thus saith the Lord. Speak anything that you desire. I don't care what it is. If you want to know that God's given this ministry, speak anything that you desire. Thus saith the Lord. If you'll speak it, I'll speak it behind you and you'll have it right here. Eight people standing there looking. She said, Brother Branham, what shall I say? I said, it's up to you. There said her crippled sister, her aged father. She is poor. She could ask for, uh, for money. She could ask for anything she wanted to. I said, ask anything that's in your heart, anything that you want to. You asked it and thus saith the Lord. I'll speak it behind you and you'll have it. She said... 
the salvation of my two boys. I said, you have it in the name of the Lord. And those two little modern teenage snickle prince boys that had hated the very cause of Christ grabbed one another and began to scream the blessings of God. The power of God struck that place. Banks fell into his plate. I don't know what happened for about ten minutes. Friend, do you realize what that was? I have never in all my life I have felt such anointing the first time it was ever performed on a human being. It bypassed aristocrats, it bypassed everything else, and went to a poor little old widow woman living up on the hill there. God know what she had asked. Her two boys was gloriously saved the very minute it was spoken. If she had asked for ten thousand dollars, it had been given to her. If she had asked for her sister's healing, it had been given to her. Anything she would have asked, it would have been given to her. I believe that the church of the living God is moving into a sphere now that's going to shake the whole world. That's the first time it's been since the days of Jesus of Nazareth. To a human being, ask anything that you will, and it shall be given unto you. Anything you desire. Don't you see the words of Jesus Christ being fulfilled? Oh, it's going to come to pass pretty soon. I'm looking for it to happen in this meeting. I'm wanting it to happen now. That that anointing will strike the whole church of the living God. And she'll rise to her feet like a mighty marching army. The sick will be healed by our word. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will be raised up, and the power of God will shake the world with the church of the living God. We're in the process of it now. I believe it's soon coming to pass. I believe it will be just exactly that way. I believe it's going to strike the church of God soon. It's going to start a revival that will shake the world. I believe it. The Lord God of heaven who made heavens and earth, whose servant I am and stand here now before you, and the name of Jesus Christ, those words are true. Oh, you're near something. My heart's waiting with anticipations. I can't even rest in my hotel room. Last night I couldn't sleep at all. It's never left me. It, I couldn't sleep on the road out here. I didn't sleep about two or three hours a night. I just can't rest because I know that something's fixing to happen. Our God's going to move on the scene just as sure as we're standing here. Just as sure as he said back under about the discernment in the hand and the secrets of the heart, he's promised something else. And here it is already confirmed among the people. People standing there in last Sunday morning in our church there at Jeffersonville, or Sunday week it is now, when I told that, there stood the whole right family giving testimony. The blessings has never left that house. They said they just don't seem like the same place. That little woman had never screamed in her life, I guess, so she, since she was a baby. You could have heard her for three city blocks screaming the praises of God and the power of God had. We were so numb to, I couldn't say nothing. I had to walk out of the building. Anointed by the power of God. God, He lives. I feel that one great thing is necessary. The Holy Spirit's speaking to me now about, I believe we ought to have a night this night that we should consecrate ourselves. Don't you think so? Are you ready, church of God? Are you ready for such a move? Have you buried every sin in the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you confessed all your wrongs? Oh, ministers of the gospel, my precious brothers, I tell you the truth, so help me, God knows that's true. And we're just shadowing something near at hand now. I don't know just where, when, or how, but I've told you exactly the God's truth, and God knows that's true. The Holy Spirit's here now. Healing. Healing. Let's get our souls healed tonight. Let's get our self-fixed in condition.
I told Billy not to give out any prayer cards tonight. I didn't want a prayer line. I want a consecration. I want this church to draw so close to God. I wanted to get so close to God until when the, we might be in this meeting here. If that'll break forth through this church here, I'm telling you, when that takes place, the coming of the Lord is at hand. The enemy with their atomic bombs is coming like a flood. The Spirit of God's rising a standard against it constantly. And just remember, just as I told you about from the discernment taking the hand to the secrets of the heart, how them things is fulfilled every time, so has this happened just exactly the way it said it would be. And it's just exactly with the Scriptures as it was proved to you about knowing the secret of the heart, how that Jesus looked upon the multitudes and discerned and could tell the people that touched his garment and so forth, how that that rain, ladder, rain, farmer, rain, and ladder would be together as we had yesterday. That's exactly. Don't you fear, church of God. I know you've got a lot of scruples among you. You've got a lot of upsets and downsets and everything else, but still you are the church of the living God. By the grace of God you are. No matter what you've done or how you've done, God forgives you of your sins. He wants a consecration. How did Balaam look down upon Israel and said they've done every dirty thing that couldn't be done? But he failed to see that they was a church of the living God. There was that smitten rock and that brass serpent before them. An atonement laying there for them. And every one of you that's been baptized with the Holy Ghost, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord is here now. That's in the name of the Lord I speak. If anybody don't believe it, speak to God about your sickness and find out. Just see if it isn't the truth. some was wondering let me straighten this one was speaking not too many words the other was interpreted many words the woman went from the interpretation into prophecy that's exactly right. did it right that's exactly right she spoke the truth amen the Holy Spirit is here the power of the living God sick there's no need of being sick you believe Or somebody that's crippled, afflicted. What about you over there in the wheelchair? You believe? You do? There's a man sitting back there behind there, looking over towards him, wearing a red tie. The angel of the Lord stands over that man. I don't know him. He's got cataracts on his eyes, though. That's right. You're not from here. Salt Lake City. This is your last night to be here. You want to go back and get well? Rise, accept your healing then. Believe it. Amen. Thou canst believe. Have faith in God. You sitting in that wheelchair over there, you're dying. Death has you overshadowed with cancer. You can't live sitting there. If you believe the Lord God, believe He's in the midst, rise to your feet, scoot back to your wheelchair and go home. What about you here? I'm going out here. 
Uh, Mr. Hammond, what about you? Do you believe that the Lord God can make you well? You're sitting there praying, believe he'll make you well. If you do, believe and go home. Get well. Hallelujah. The Lord God is in the midst of his people. Do you believe it? Let us all rise to our feet. This is the hour of divine consecration. If you can believe. The Lord God requires a consecration. He cannot break forth upon us until we've been so surrendered to His will, to His power. He cannot break forth until we have our hearts so cleansed from sin and things of the world, until the Holy Ghost can ride in upon us and so surround us now as He has me right now. How do I know these things? It's not me. It's Him that's speaking. I've told the truth about Him. There is breaking forth something new. Watch and see it's already happening. It'll break forth just as certain as I'm standing in this platform. All right, be ready for to receive the Lord God in great blessings. You, church of the God, church of the living God, each one of you. Now let's take this night for this, a consecration. A consecration to God. That you would take, you sick people, forget your sickness. While the God of heaven stands here. Where's he at? All over you, all through you, all in you. God of heaven. Sure you raise your hands, raise your voices, consecrate yourself to the Lord. Lord God, I consecrate myself. Help me in this new ministry, Lord, that your power, your strength, and your mercy will anoint me with the Holy Ghost. And if you'll consecrate this church and these things that I've said about these animals that you spoke into existence, Lord God, take your church and the power into your custody and fill with the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, forgive the sins of the church. Forgive our differences, Lord. And pour out from on high the baptism of the Holy Ghost freshly and new upon your peoples. Grant it, Lord. Put your hands in the air. Praise Him. Sing glorious praises. Consecrate yourself to Him. The man's out of the wheelchair. Praising God with his hands up in the air. The man was in the wheelchair is out giving God praise. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Oh, ye people. Let the Holy Ghost take over the meeting and carry it into consecration. Each one of you dig down in your hearts and take out all the root of bitterness. Take out all the sin, all the unbelief, all the skepticism that you've had in your heart. Throw it out. Get ready. The Holy Ghost is going to do great things in the midst of you. Lord God, hear the prayer of your children, consecrating themselves to you. We come believing. We believe you, Lord, with all of our hearts we believe you. We repent of our sins. Lord, forgive me of all of my mistakes. Forgive my ministering brother for their mistakes. Forgive the church of their mistakes. Lord God, sanctify our hearts so deeply with love and with power and with consecration. Find favor with us, Lord. Pour out your power. We will not do anything wrong. I believe every man in here would have made the same thing that night when it was given to speak evil to that boy. We would not use your power for evil things. We would use it, Lord, only for your glory to heal your sick children. Oh, Lord, send your power. Send it upon us, Lord. Not for our will, but for the glory of God. The heathens are raging. They are saying they imagined vain things. But let the Holy Ghost shake this place again where we're assembled together telling the stories of the power of the Lord God. Granted, Lord, let the Russian mighty winds sweep through every heart, burn out all sin, all iniquity, all doubts, all fears, and may every person become a consecrated saint unto thee. Hear us, O Lord. May we go from here with boldness. May we go with a deep, settled peace in our hearts, with a real faith that'll shake mountains. The word we ask, grant it, Lord. Bless my ministering brethren. Bless all that's present. Bless the sick people. Here you've healed the sick. Here's the afflicted and sitting in wheelchairs, standing up. Those with crutches, throw them on the floor. The sick and the afflicted with their hands in the air, praising you. We love you, Lord. We believe you. We know that you're God. We know that these things that's asked, you say, when you pray, believe that you get what you ask for, and it shall be given unto thee. That's your word, Lord. We believe it. And our prayers, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your promises, for they're all true. They're yea and amen to each one. Hear us, Lord. 
speak through us and use us for your glory. We consecrate ourselves to thee. We dedicate ourselves. I dedicate myself anew over this pulpit tonight, Lord. Lord, God, try me. If there's any evil in me, take it away, Lord. If there's anything that you could use me for to help your church and your people further to a better ministry, to a better understanding of God. Here I am, Lord. Speak and your servant will hear. I'll answer, Lord. Just speak and I'll do anything that you'd say to me to do. Lord, God, may I have favor in your sight. Not for self-glory you've tried in the fires of that, Lord, but for the help of your church and the sake of your people that's scattered throughout the world now. May they become together as one church, as one unit, as one as one person. May we stand in the power of the resurrection. May you pour out your spirit and gifts upon your church. That'll be an outstanding thing to the world, Lord. That'll cause all men to know what they have left behind. Grant it, Lord. We give these prayers to you for answer, believing that you'll do it. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Do you love him? Raise up your hands like this. Just raise your hands and praise him. All your heart. Just give him praise. your heart free from sin you feel good now how many's consecrated their lives anew to God raise your hands I consecrate myself to thee O Lord thou art my God my Savior is Jesus Christ and I now give myself fully and completely to thee for thy service let it be like that in your heart I believe God's going to do a great thing among us it's already started and if it started like this what will it be after it goes a little while Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, let us sing this good old hymn of the church now. Before we leave, my faith looks up to thee. That's where we stand. That's the only thing that will move a mountain. That's when God has to anoint you to such faith that it cannot fail. My faith looks up to thee. Let's sing it now with our eyes and our hands and our hearts lifted to God. All together now. My faith looks up to Thee, the Lamb of Calvary, a Savior
I tread in the fields and grief around me spread. Be thou my God. Bid darkness turn to day. Why sorrows, fears away? No, let me ever stray from thee. Thank <laughs> you.